Okay, good afternoon. My name is Jenny Lee, Under Secretary General at HKGFA. Welcome to the webinar on measuring portfolio alignment to climate goals, presented by the COP26 portfolio alignment team and organized by the HKGFA Green and Sustainable Banking Working Group, co-chaired by Jonathan Drew from HSBC and Danny Wong from Bank of China. HKGFA has partnered with the COP26 Financial Coalition Coordination Mechanism that have pledged support to mobilize and coordinate and align local and global initiatives with the ambitious climate change action led by the COP26 presidency and the Race to Zero. We are delighted to have two distinguished speakers from COP26 portfolio alignment team with us today. Our agenda today will kick off with opening remarks from Danny Wong, followed by the PAT presentation and Q&A moderated by Jonathan Drew. Um, during the webinar, you'll be able to post your questions in the Q&A session box at the toolbar of the Zoom screen. Um, and I encourage you to take the opportunity and ask questions. A copy of the presentation will be available at the end of this webinar. And so without much further ado, I will now pass the floor to Danny Wong, the banking co-chair. Oh, thank you, Jenny. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome all of you to join today's training webinar. Today's topic is measuring portfolio alignment against, against goal, climate goal. As we know, from the end of last year, Mainland China and the Hong Kong SAR government have publicly announced the country and region's commitment to carbon neutrality. But aligning our financial portfolio with the Paris Agreement is a challenging task. It requires forward-looking methodologies, mature transitional and execution plans, as well as collective effort to meet the, this climate goal. The portfolio alignment team established and led by former Bank of England government, UN Special Combo, Envo for Climate and Finance, Mark Carney, is leading the research on measuring portfolio alignment emerging tools and providing recommendations on best practice. The team has recently published two technical papers for measuring portfolio alignment in June. The papers are very encouraging toward the right direction and provide guidance to some commonly asked questions on measuring portfolio alignment. Today, we are very honored and privileged to have Tangu and Dao Domina from the portfolio alignment team to share with us the recent, the recent research result. This is a great opportunity for us uh, to learn uh, global best practice from the experts. Tang Tangu Singh is a manager at the COP26 private finance hub and member of the portfolio alignment team that produced the TCFD technical supplement on portfolio alignment. Previously, he worked as a Basel committee advisor at the Bank of England. Domina Tai is a policy advisor in the COP26 private finance hub and a co-author of the TCFD technical paper on portfolio alignment matrix. This is a team of people supporting Mark Carney in a mission to build a private finance system for net zero. I hope all of you enjoy today's training session. Tengu and Domine, thank you very much for giving us this training session today. Now don't delay everyone. I would like to hand over to Tengu and Domine to deliver us their insightful sharing. Domine first, thank you. Uh, to me that you have uh, mute your thank you perfect okay thank you very much for the kind introduction Danny and Jenny very much appreciate it and thanks for inviting us um, along to talk to the Hong Kong Green Finance Association we're delighted to be here at least um, virtually so as, as Danny mentioned today we're going to present to you on the work of the COP26 uh, portfolio alignment team in the first half of the presentation, um, I will introduce the context of the work, what portfolio alignment tools are, and what we're trying to achieve with the TCFD technical report. And then in the second half of the presentation, my colleague Tangi will run through the specific suggestions that the PAT team has made in the technical report um, on the construction of portfolio alignment tools. So I'll start by introducing the portfolio alignment team. 
As Danny mentioned, the PAT team was established by Mark Carney, former Governor of the Bank of England and UN Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance. And work on portfolio alignment metrics forms part of the finance agenda ahead of the COP26 conference in Glasgow later this year. So this, the finance agenda that Mark is leading on really builds on this recognition that transitioning our economies towards net zero is going to require the mobilization of all forms of finance. In other words, finance is an enabler of this transition. And alongside other innovations that um, we are pursuing, um, such as better climate reporting, climate risk management and development of carbon markets, the promotion and, and mainstreaming of portfolio alignment tools is one of the way that, ways that we can mobilize finance in support of the transition to net zero. And the work that we've done in the portfolio alignment tool at portfolio alignment team is precisely aimed at mainstreaming portfolio alignment tools by building understanding and consistency. So now turning to the report, the PAT team is responsible for writing a TCFD technical paper that summarizes emerging best practice in constructing and using portfolio alignment tools. And portfolio alignment tools are metrics that assess the alignment of an asset or a portfolio with forward-looking decarbonisation benchmarks. And examples here could be the percentage of your portfolio covered by science-based targets or the emissions overshoot of your portfolio or the implied temperature rise associated with um, your portfolio. So our, our paper provides this best practice guide that should help to drive convergence in the construction of, of these tools and mean that the end users trust that the metrics reflect action in the real world. In terms of next steps, our paper will be published by the TCFD as a technical supplement in October, alongside a paper on metrics, targets and transition planning. So now, how, how in the theory do portfolio alignment tools, such as your percentage of portfolio with science-based targets and implied temperature rise metrics, help to support the transition of our economies? So if well designed, these tools can help support the transition in a number of ways. So the first one I'll, I'll mention is that these tools can help to track progress um, in a way that doesn't penalise firm or, or portfolio growth. So if you're looking just at the absolute emissions associated with a portfolio, clearly that's going to be dependent on the size of the portfolio. If your portfolio doubles in size, absolute emissions will also double if there's no change in the emissions intensity of the activities in the portfolio. But what this means is that just looking at absolute emissions may not be very informative. In contrast, with a well-designed portfolio alignment tool, we get a, a measure that's not sensitive to size. And the second contribution of well-designed tools is that they can help incentivize the transition by tracking progress in a way that doesn't encourage wholesale divestment from high emitting, hard to abate sectors. And these sectors, let's say like the uh, steel sector or cement sector um, or shipping, aviation, these are sectors that we're still going to need even in a successful 1.5 degree um, scenario. So what a, what a portfolio alignment tool can do is within sectors, within activities, help to distinguish between the leaders and laggards. So a third benefit of a well-designed 
at all is that they can help management and financial institutions to diagnose where portfolio misalignment lies and therefore where they may need to uh, address corrective actions, whether that be engagement or divestment. And lastly, and linked to that last, last point, the widespread use of portfolio alignment tools by financial institutions then sends a signal to non-financial corporates that they need to adjust their operations in order to maintain their funding arrangements. So now I'll talk a little bit more in detail about the options financial institutions have in order to track the alignment of their portfolio. And there are three broad categories of tool um, that we can look at here. Firstly, we have binary target measurements. So this is something like the percentage of uh, investments, the percentage of, of assets in my portfolio that are covered by a science-based target. So these tools are, are pretty simple to implement, um, but they, they don't provide any, any information on the degree of alignment. Um, and also they're vulnerable to the risk that they'll incentivize great target setting, but then that may not actually materialize into actual reduction in, in emissions. Next, we have benchmark divergence models. And these models are looking at forward-looking projected performance against a normative benchmark, a benchmark that tells you the trajectory that a company should be on, either in technology mixed terms, like this is the percentage of electric cars that should be within your portfolio relative to internal combustion cars over time, or in emissions terms. This is the slope in terms of absolute emissions or emissions intensity that the, your company or portfolio needs to follow. So these tools are far more complex to construct and need to you need to have some degree of specialized expertise. But the advantage of them is that they can be more informative but also help to make a more detailed assessment of the degree of alignment of a company or portfolio on a continuous scale. So you can distinguish between a firm that is a firm or portfolio that is 5% off the mark or at, with one which is overshooting by 10% or 50%. Whereas if you're using that binary measurement, a firm is either aligned or it's not. And now turning to the most complex models, um, which are, are referred to as implied temperaturized models. And what these models do is translate a degree of alignment with a benchmark. So our, our middle um, step here on, this, on the slide, and they translate that into the form of a temperature score. So in terms of communication to an end user, this metric is pretty informative. You can say the activities of my portfolio are associated with a two degree warming outcome. However, actually deriving this metric is very complex and it requires an additional layer of assumptions to translate benchmark divergence into an estimation of the impact to the climate. And what you're essentially doing here is asking the question, if everyone in the world acted in the same way as this company or portfolio, what would the resulting global warming be? So now I've introduced a little bit about what, what portfolio alignment metrics are. I'll turn to the problem with the state of portfolio alignment metrics that we have been seeking to address on the TCFD technical paper. So the issue to date with portfolio alignment metrics has been in the construction of complex emissions-based measures of portfolio alignment, in particular the implied temperature rise metrics that I touched on. 
So in short, the outputs of different tools have often been inconsistent. So you, you could get the same firm or the same portfolio getting a two degree warming score from one tool and then a four degree warming score from another tool because of the differences in the methodologies used in order to calculate that score. And another issue is that the methodologies used to generate these metrics are or can be very opaque and therefore difficult to comprehend for a lay person. So the purpose of the PAP paper and um, the framework that Tangi is going to introduce is to act as a first step towards addressing these issues with, with complex portfolio alignment tools by one, reducing the scope for methodological divergence and two, demystifying the analytical steps that are required in order to construct a portfolio alignment tool which should in turn build understanding of the value of these tools. So there I've provided you some background on portfolio alignment tools and the purpose of the PAT reports. I'll now hand over to Tangi to run through some of the specific methodological suggestions that we make in the report. Thanks, Dominique. Um, so <clears throat> hi, everyone. And uh, as Dominique said, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Dominique, I'll rely on you for the slides. Uh, so we'll try to do it with the appropriate tempo and I'll try to go uh, as fast as possible. So uh, I, I just say that because now we're getting into the detail of what the report uh, suggested to build good metrics. So you have a good overview of what we're trying to achieve. Thanks to Dominique. So uh, opening the black box of these metrics and driving convergence. So uh, you, you'll go through three methodological steps that we identified. So first, how you said you set the decarbonization benchmarks against which you score company. Secondly, once you have those benchmarks, what uh, data elements of the, about the companies do you use to benchmark them? And then step three, once you have individual scores, so you have, say, if it's a temperature rise, uh, two degrees company and a three degrees and a four degrees and all your set of company, how do you aggregate them into a single score? Each of these steps is broken down into a key judgment that uh, we'll explore now. Uh, next. Right. Um, so um, the, the first key judgment about the type of the benchmark is uh, how do you derive them for, from climate scenarios? Um, all ben decarbonization benchmarks come from climate scenarios and portfolio alignment tools. It's science-based. Uh, maybe the most important uh, graph that uh, you, you should remember for the function, basic functioning of a portfolio alignment tool is the one on the left. So you, you can see uh, so the, the benchmark is the dark line running from uh, today till uh, 2050. And it, it gives you a sort of trajectory for here, uh, emissions intensity that a firm has to comply with in order to be on track with the uh, decarbonization needed in the sector. So let's say the dark line is the benchmark for the steel industry. And then the blue line is your actual company that you're benchmarking. You can see a sort of big overshoot today and then the overshoot uh, diminishes until 2040 when the company meets the benchmark. Uh, but you can see all the, all, all the emission intensity overshoot that happens until uh, 2040. So there are basically two approaches to look at scenarios. One, you just take a dedicated scenario and you just stick to the trajectory uh, that you can deduce from it. So let's say uh, IEA uh, steel industry uh, scenario, and then you, you take the benchmark you derive the benchmark or you do a sort of average of various uh, scenarios and you, you draw a sort of regression analysis. So based on such emissions of uh, the firm, what does it result in on average across several scenarios? Sort of. So we recommend to take the first approach because it's much clearer and more transparent. Uh, the second one uh, is, is used uh, only by um, one uh, player mainly. Second slide. 
Okay, and uh, and that might be uh, the most uh, maybe the most difficult slide, but once you once we've overcome it, uh, everything should be easy. Uh, so now now that you you derive the benchmark, you have to distinguish different uh, different dynamics. So when you use a rate of reduction benchmark, you need to draw a straight line between uh, what what the, the 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 company is uh today where it is today and then uh, the future so that's uh top right um Dominic, i don't know if you can like sort of highlight uh the fact that so you you have like in this graph you basically have uh, two net zero oops uh, can, can you come back you, you have basically two scenarios was one ending in uh in uh, net zero in uh, 2040, the other one in 2050. And all companies have to uh, follow uh, fo follow bench, uh, the, this sort of trajectory, whether they start uh, above or uh, below the, the given benchmark. So let's say for 2050, if you have a company that starts uh, below the uh, indicative uh, benchmark, it still has to meet uh, the th same trajectory. Basically, it penalizes uh, firms that have already decreased significantly their emission. Uh, they still need to apply the uh, same kind of rate of reduction as uh, companies that have emitted a lot above the benchmark. Uh, on the, the, the left side, the convergence benchmark. So that means that the benchmark is defined as the the, the sort of target the average uh, emission uh, intensity or absolute that all firms in the sector should uh, comply with. So let's say it's X uh, CO2 per uh, dollar. And then you have a given level for each year until uh, 2015 net zeros. So this is the standard for all companies, meaning that if you've made already decarbonization efforts before, you won't be penalized because you don't have to decarbonize at the same rate as the company that you can see above that started from a higher point than the average uh, standard for the industry. And then you have the fair, car fair share carbon budget below. Uh, so this approach uh, is a sort of uh, combination of uh, intensity and absolute emission. Basically, the principle is that you break down your companies into uh, each relevant uh, sector, each relevant sectors. Let's say, for instance, your company uh, operates in uh, both uh, oil and uh, renewable. Uh, so you break down into different uh, pathways. You compare the intensity, the carbon intensity of your company in each of these activity to the one prescribed by the scenario. And from there, you deduced a, a decarbonization trajectory benchmark, which is uh, steeper or, or, or more stable, depending on uh, how far your company is from uh, the benchmark. So it means essentially that depending on where your company is uh, at the start. Uh, so remember the convergence benchmark. It has to comply with a certain trajectory in terms of decarbonization. It will be e expressed in absolute emissions term. So it'd be like uh, uh, from uh, 10 tons today, you go to nine tons uh, next year, then eight ton, et cetera, not intensity. Uh, so we recommend or in terms of dynamics of the, of the benchmark, we simply recommend that uh, the fair share carbon budget can be uh, adopted for any kind of uh, sector. That when you have homogeneous industries, you can use a convergence benchmark because it's easy to extract the benchmark from uh, scenarios. So it's easy to have to find a, a scenario such as IEA steel that gives you the kind of carbon intensity the steel industry should aim for. On the other hand, for homogeneous, for non-homogeneous uh, industries, 
which are like uh, more than 80% companies. You should use a rate of reduction benchmark. If you don't use a Farrer share carbon budget, you should use a rate of reduction benchmark because uh, it's, it's, it's more, much more robust in the absence of clearly uh, 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 standard uh, derivation from a climate scenarios. So I hope it sort of makes sense. And uh, as we progress, uh, we, can, uh, we can discuss uh, further on this. Do we need the next? Okay, um, so this one, uh, and I think it relates to a question that was asked. So just uh, to be very clear, uh, we looked at scenarios. Uh, and of course, there are several climate scenarios that can be chosen to benchmark. So what we recommend is to have a set of uh, criteria to uh, choose these scenarios so that there is no cherry picking and some kind of uh, scenario arbitrage, potentially greenwashing. So we recommend that financial institutions should select 1.5 uh, degree scenarios and comply with a certain number of uh, criteria established by the SBTI. Now, in terms of the granularity of the benchmarks, we recommend to set them as granular as possible, meaning at the geographical and at the sectoral level to account for the harder to abate uh, sector and the harder to abate geography. So we're not comparing uh, apples with oranges. In, in short, you wouldn't assess all companies uh, against a minus 7% uh, carbon uh, reduction every year, for instance, you would say, okay, the, the, the companies that are in the uh, energy sector in China should not decarbonize at the same rate as uh, US tech companies simply because they can't. So you reflect in your benchmark, in the trajectory of your benchmark, the different efforts needed uh, for decarbonization. Next. Okay, now, uh, should we use uh, absolute emissions or emissions intensity? So fair share carbon budget, as I explained, is a combination of both. It's, you look at emission intensity at the beginning, whether your company is above, below uh, the standard. If it's, above, uh, uh, if it's above the benchmark, the, the, the slope is steeper. Uh, and if it's uh, below, it's less uh, steep than other companies. But in any case, you use a combination of intensity and absolute. The alternative approach is to use uh, intensity, uh, and then we recommend to use physical emission intensity, meaning emissions, so say CO2 per uh, unit of production, so CO2 per car produced, for instance. We recommend physical intensity instead of economic intensity, which would be CO2 per uh, dollars of uh, revenue of uh, the company, simply because physical intensity does not suffer from uh, the same exposure to uh, volatility. Next slide. Uh, there's just one exception that we identified, oil and gas. So in, in this particular case, the, the issue is they, they produce how to decarbonize um, outputs, such as a barrel of oil that you cannot really decarbonize beneath a certain level. So uh, a carbon intensity is not uh, ideal in order to benchmark uh, this type of companies. So we say there are two ways of dealing with that. Uh, either you use a uh, rate of reduction uh, in absolute uh, emission, or you use a sort of broad uh, energy-based uh, intensity uh, benchmark reflecting a type of company that has diversified into uh, renewables. So you, you would say CO2 per watts per joules, all oil and gas companies must uh, achieve a state of carbon intensity 
that reflects a company that has uh, diversified into uh, renewables in that sector. Next. Um, and then the, the, the last uh, point uh, about the benchmark construction. So you, I'm sure you're all familiar with scope one, two, three of a GHG protocol. So we recommend, of course, to include scope one and two, but also scope three for the sectors uh, that are, uh, for which it's the most material. So oil and gas, automotive, mining, heavy industry. Next. Uh, so now, once you've built your benchmark, what kind of data will you use uh, from the company? So to be very quick on that one, uh, you'd cover uh, all the type of greenhouse gases. Uh, so including methane and you can mix them. But we recommend that in time, uh, methane specific benchmark has built because, are built because those type of gases are short lived. And so that makes, uh, that has an impact in the, in the way you assess uh, the potential uh, contribution to warming temperature. Next. Uh, this one relates to the forward looking elements uh, of uh, the tool. So if you remember the, the first graph we saw a couple of slides uh, before, you, you have a, an overshoot or undershoot uh, today, for the company against its benchmark. But you're also looking into the future because you're comparing against uh, this forward looking decarbonization benchmark taken from um, climate scenarios. So how do you how do you project the future emissions of the company? So we say, uh, don't take uh, only targets for granted. Let's say a company says, I'm net zero in uh, 2050, and then linear extrapolation or in 2030. So just don't take targets for granted, but equally don't project solely based on historical emissions because uh, otherwise you would not reflect the fact that the past is not going to pred uh, is not going to be reflective of the future uh, because of current regu regulatory pressure, um, shareholder pressure, societal pressure. Next. And then I think uh, yeah, we'll draw to. So this is simply uh, like, how, how do you assess the, the, the total trajectory, uh, the, the, the total carbon emissions? Because there are two ways, either point in time. So as the company reached its benchmark in say uh, 2040 or 2030, or do we look at the cumulative emission? So. In order to be conservative, the report recommends to look at cumulative emissions. So you can see uh, on this graph, uh, you can see an, an overshoot in the first, uh, until uh, 2030, say, say. If the company wants to be compliant with the benchmark, it would have to produce a, a similar overshoot in terms of cumulative emission. So uh, an, uh, an undershot of the, of the same uh, magnitude from uh, 2030 uh, until uh, the rest of the period. Next. Okay, and then how do you express the metric? So we say uh, financial institution should pick the unit of expression they, that is more useful for them. But uh, if they choose implied temperature rise, they should either use a TCRE multiplier in the short term or what we recommend in the medium term, a uh, multiple uh, benchmark interpolation. So I can come back of, uh, on that later. It's, it's a very technical point about how you get to temperature, uh, but maybe during Q&A. Next slide, and uh, that should be uh, the last. So once you have your individual score, how do you aggregate them? So you have basically two ways uh, that are illustrated here. So on the right hand side that uh, Dominique uh, points out, it's a very simple uh, weighted average. So you, you're probably familiar with this way of uh, looking at scores. So let's say uh, you have uh, a two company portfolio, 20% is invested in a uh, company A, 80% in company B. Uh, you just 
weight the company B score by 80%, company A score by 20%, uh, and then you get the final score. The problem with that is that it may underestimate uh, the level of financed emissions because it's the average weighting that plays a, a strong role in determining the final score. So that's why we recommend for the purpose of disclosing portfolio alignment, the method on the left. So it consists of whether you use the absolute emission or intensity benchmark, you just go back to a level of absolute emissions. So you see company, uh, say company A is in a uh, light blue, company B is in dark blue. You accumulate the, all their emission over the period of assessment. So between now and 2030 uh, or between uh, now in 2050, you accumulate all their, uh, their emissions, so current and projected against uh, the relevant carbon budget. So let's say you, you made a one, one million loan in a company that, uh, to a company that is worth uh, 10 million. Uh, it means you own 10% of the emission of that company and you own 10% of its uh, benchmark slash carbon budget. So you just stack the emission compared to the aggregated budget. And here you can say, you can see that there is a, an overshoot, a total overshoot because of company uh, two, as uh, Dominic uh, illustrated it, because company two went far above its overshoot. It's a benchmark, sorry. Uh, and so maybe the last slide very quickly. Uh, which is next. Yeah. And so this is just to say that we explore the many aspects of how to build a portfolio metrics, but obviously uh, a data environment is uh, needed to help these tools uh, thrive. Uh, number one, company uh, emissions data. Number two, fit for purpose climate scenarios because climate scenarios don't cover all sectors. It's not always easy to extract a benchmark. And then lastly, uh, as Dominic pointed out, how we can drive a better convergence uh, between those tools. And I think that's it. Uh, and apologies for the extra time. Well, Dominic and Tongi, thank you so much for that. Um, presentation. I, I suspect like many of us, I'm, I'm, I'm scribbling down notes um, crazily as, as you went through there. Um, I'm going to try now and sort of pull together um, a, a few questions, perhaps both to sort of confirm, confirm an understanding of, of what you've been, been through there, but also to, um, you know, address the questions that are coming through um, on the, on, on the Q&A item and perhaps I'll start there because there are there are a couple there and you did start to answer those um, Tongi around um, really sort of thinking about um, how benchmarks how targets might need to be varied according to sort of geographical um, lo location and both both of the questions go 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 to that I think I think you you started to explain and in in, in reference to um, one one of one of the slides how um, the, the recommended methodology does recognize that there'll be different speeds of um, different speeds of transition as it were but how how as a practical matter do you establish the differences in those or quantify the differences in those um, benchmarks and perhaps it goes to a comment you made I think in in talking about that this sort of concept of um, the fair share approach maybe you could sort of expand on that a little bit uh, Tongi I think that's going to be quite a quite a quite a key issue for many, many people listening yes so on the so there are two different things in in what uh, you mentioned uh, Jonathan so uh, yes on, on the projecting uh, benchmarking companies in different sectors and, uh, and region uh, the, it has to be rooted in a climate scenario. And so when you look at uh, climate scenarios like uh, World Economic Forum or IPCC, you can see that the rate of decarbonization of a region like uh, China and India cannot be the same 
as uh, the rest of uh, as some other parts in the world, like uh, Europe and US. So you start to you have to start from there and then add investors' uh, uh, assumptions because they, there are many the, the the climate scenarios are not made for investment purpose. So they lack a lot of granularity about sectors assumptions. So for instance, your assumptions about how fast uh, hydrogen uh, will be rolled out in uh, producing uh, uh, steel or other kind of uh, industry. And then the fair share carbon budget is, so is related to that because they, they, they do rely on, if you have a diversified company, um, you, you, you do have to take in to, to, to take into account your several benchmark by sub-industry. So for instance, let's say your food company, for, uh, and then you, you have like a line of business, which is meat, one which is uh, vegetables, etc. So if you set granular pathways, the de decarbonization uh, pathways for several of your business lines, uh, that plays a role in, in combining a total company specific benchmark. So, so it's related to that. The idea of fair share is related um, to uh, something I didn't dwell on, uh, which is not penalizing uh, growth. So if your company uh, grow, so it has an absolute re emissions reduction benchmark, but if your company grows, your benchmark should take that, your method should take that into account. And that's what the fair share carbon budget uh, does. It says, okay, if you, if you buy, if your company A had a, uh, an objective of minus 10% on its baseline e emission uh, in 2020, but it, but it acquire company B. And so it's a, a level of emissions doubled in order not to penalize uh, my company uh, A, you have a market share adjustment. So, so it, it doesn't, um, so, th so that the net results doesn't overshoot the benchmark necessarily uh, or too much, if that makes sense. Okay, no, I, I understand that target. Maybe there's a question there in that sort of, you talked about the fair share allocation of the carbon budget, mm -hmm. um, which I guess is the carbon budget that's associated with any particular temperature rise. In, 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 the, in the recommended methodology, I mean, whose who's calculation of the fair share are you suggesting that people look at? I mean, who's, who, who's the arbiter of what's fair or not, if I can put it in those terms? Ah. Um, so, at, well, at this stage, we didn't standardize uh, the way it should be done. Oh, you, you mean uh, like in terms of fair share, the, like splitting the, the carbon budget per, per region and... Uh, exactly, and per, and per different activity and... Uh, that's... So that's a very good question. It's, it's actually, it starts from the climate scenarios. So the, the, this, this uh, splitting of a carbon budget is decided by the scenario provider. But, but you have a good point because yeah. you can choose between the various scenarios. And so for instance, uh, the, the carbon budget of uh, China, uh, which is allocated to China, might vary depending on uh, like whether it's uh, a World Economic Forum or like uh, IPCC right. scenarios and whether it's a two degrees or three degree scenarios because the carbon budget varies depending on the scenarios as well. So, if, yeah. yeah. If, if I may add a, a, a small point there, if, um, if you're familiar with the new NGFS scenarios and the Scenario Explorer, you're, you're, you'll see that there is a certain breakdown to a regional level under the different scenarios. So your orderly transition or disorderly transition that outlines the carbon budget for a region. But then, as Tangi was saying, if you're trying to get down to a specific, a specific benchmark for a subsector, that will require judgment on the behalf of the methodology provider, the financial institution, to think about, okay, how am I going to split up that, that carbon budget in order to assess individual firms or, uh, against the activities that they are involved in? So does this then, Dominic, really become a, because clearly... In, in a sense, the what NGFS has put out there in the scenario suite at the moment, I mean, they're not necessarily 
agreed allocations of the budget to individual markets in a sense that's i guess that's going to be part of the the, the cop process so for a bank using scenarios but is the key therefore is really just to disclose and declare which scenarios you're using in in creating your benchmarks and pathways yeah ab absolutely and, and one of the points that we emphasize in the report is the importance of disclosure both disclosure on of the judgments that um, you have made in constructing your tool, but also crucially the ingredients, which is what we, we're talking about, the scenarios that you've chosen, the data that you're using. So it's transparent to users how you've actually ended up with this, this output. Because as you, as you say, the NGFS scenarios are an illustration of how the budget would need to be split in order to be compatible with certain outcomes, but which is not the same as this is what countries have agreed in terms of the distribution of the remaining carbon budget. Yes, and there clearly there'll be multiple different splits that could arrive at the same outcome. And we could give all of the budget to country A and none to everybody else, but that clearly wouldn't be fair. So, yeah. and, and there's, a, there's another question then, sort of getting into the sort of the detail around that about how you then measure, because clearly, and, and a lot of banks are, you know, I think working very hard to look at this concept of, financed emissions, which seems sort of to be key and core to the, the, the pathways here. Um, and so the question, and I think this is and hopefully just a, just a clarification, but I guess it's going to be very important that when you, as a financial institution's measures, they're both transparent in the methodology they're using, and there are many des design decisions that you have to make as you decide how you measure. And then presumably, and I think this, I'm just hopefully stating the obvious here, you then would need to apply the same methodology in creating your projected projected pathways. So do we, where, where do we, what, or what do you, so what do you sort of recommend about where banks should be going to do the financed emissions calculations? Is it like, should we, are you recommending that the banks should sort of converge around using something like PCAF so that we're all using consistent accounting standards. Because obviously, and you touched upon, you know, this concept, I guess, of attributed emissions to financial transactions, which is relatively straightforward for a simple loan, but it quickly gets very complicated when you have different types of financial products and services that are offered. So I guess we all need to be an interest in your thoughts on getting consistency around the accounting for financed emissions as part of you know, this trajectory work that you're doing um, on the accounting uh, mm. i'll just say that it's consistent with the pcaf framework which is incorporated uh, in the report so we didn't mention it but okay. and so and so let, let uh, to cover your whole point just like pcaf the methodology for portfolio alignment cannot cover all type of assets at the moment. So if you take the BKF methodology, the six assets, the six type of uh, assets, including uh, mortgages, that, that's basically it in terms of, you know, the method uh, you, you have to, to measure the, the emissions. So in terms of financial uh, instruments. Uh, but for instance, the method that we have developed cannot be applied uh, as such to sovereigns. So when you disclose portfolio alignment, it would be a, a portion of your portfolio. You say, I, I was able to cover like 30% of my portfolio uh, with the data, with uh, the, the asset for which I have a methodology. And uh, this is the alignment. Okay. Okay, now that's very helpful. So, so just, just to be getting crystal clear, so in a sense, in, in your recommendations, there really is a recommendation as well to adopt PCAF. Okay. Okay. That's, that's clear. Um, the, the other point I wanted to raise, and, and there are a couple of sort of thing, I've got the, the word sort of convergence you, you, you used a lot. And I sort of want to just probe into that on, on, on sort of two different levels. The first, the first is um, sort of convergence of, a, of an individual entity to this sort of global or country average pathway. And, and, and thinking what, what that means, if, for example, because clearly in a, at the portfolio level, I think it's, it, it, it's clear, we, we, 
you know, we, we have to find that pathway towards towards zero. But at the individual entity level, you could have players who will say, well, my pathway is I'm going to be the last person standing in the production of coal-fired power. And then I'm by the end of my, in 30 years time, I'll have closed my business and given my capital back to the shareholders. And over time, obviously there, as the sector shrinks, their market share would grow. And that might be a perfectly rational, somewhat high risk, I would suggest, but in, in, in a sense, rational strategy. And another player might say, well, no, I'm going to go fast and quick into you know, the low carbon alternative. Um, and that's going to be my transition pathway. So how, how in this methodology, is, isn't, is there a risk that we're sort of asking all of our, expecting all players to converge to the average? Whereas actually we, what we really would expect to see, and maybe it's, it's optimal, is that we've got some companies who are going to specialize in the new energy and some companies who are going to specialize in, you know, managing the old assets and retiring those down. How, how, does, how does the methodology a, a, a address that? Perhaps I can ask that question, Ali. It's, it's, a, great, it's a great question. And w one of the things that is baked into the use of our methodologies is being able to, within sectors, once you define your sector, being able to distinguish between the leaders in those sectors and the laggards. So if you are an energy firm that is uh, investing in, in renewables or seeking to decarbonize operations, um, then you would be re rewarded um, if a methodology was using, it, say, an implied temperature rise. And that, that, in our view, is a desirable feature because it provides an incentive for companies within each, each sector to follow that, that path of decarbonization. I take your, your point that necessarily at a global level there will be some th th there will be some firms who are continuing to say offer fossil fuel um, services. Um, I think that it's a slightly different problem to deal with and not one which we're, sort of, we're trying to tackle with portfolio alignment tools. Um, there are a range of other policy solutions that you could deal you could use to address um, say the one remaining coal power power plant um, ideas, for instance, are, are like the creation of a bad bank that could steward these assets um, on the path to net zero. But I don't think that's something that we we're trying to tackle with the use of, of alignment metrics. Okay, um, understood. Understood. I'm just conscious of the time and the clock ticking away thank you for that answer there's there are a couple of questions which go to a point on data probably won't be surprised to hear this one clearly for a bank to do this to calculate financed emissions today they need data they're going to need that data as well as they start to think about you know what their current client pool how they might project that forward if clients aren't disclosing that data where do banks go to get it how do we how do we address this this data gap Again, it's a it's this is a tricky one, and particularly in, in emerging markets, and there is a dependency here on climate reporting. So one of the things that we are trying to do as part of the COP finance agenda is really get global agreement to have a reporting framework in place for for um, scope one, two, and three emissions. And in a sense, that's a that's a necessary ingredient to being able to use complex portfolio alignment tools in a fully consistent way. Um, where, where we are at the moment is that um, you can use databases like CDP or, or self-reported emissions. TrueCost um, is a commercial provider of, of this data. There are also a variety of um, providers that use input-output uh, models that you can use to estimate scope three emissions for different sectors based on product life cycles. So the, the state that we are at the, at the moment is that you have for a portion of the market reported emissions, um, but for the rest you're going to have to use um, 
modeled emissions or proxies based on, on regional and industry averages. But the direction of travel is towards more widespread global climate reporting. Great, Dominic, thank you. Jenny, I fear we are coming up to time um, and we probably could have gone on for another good um, good half an hour, given the number of you know really critical questions that are coming in and, and, and the key topics here. But I, I, I think I had better um, wrap up, conscious that um, people probably have um, five five pm meetings to get to. With a with, with a huge thank you to uh, Dominic and Tongi for, for 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 sharing today, and in fact doing more than sharing, um, bringing bringing to us the, the sort of the output of obviously what's been a hugely um, technically challenging um, piece of work and, and, and being able to communicate that in a, in, in, in a manner that's so, so clear and compelling. And I think for all of the, um, certainly the banks on the call um, and, and, and others in the um, Green Finance Association and Association of Banks Network who are, you know, crucial participants in this transition process that we're trying to um, support here. It's, it's very clear that if we are committed to net zero, as Danny confirmed right, right up front, then we need, we need to be, if we're serious about it, we need to be measuring it. Otherwise, we're, not, we're really not going to have um, those, those guide rails and, and understanding how to get forward. So um, I think that message has come across very clearly, as well as the message that this is, um, this is not a simple task. There are tremendous complexities. I think having something like the work of the um, of, of the portfolio alignment team to to guide us is going to be critically important. Um, I'm imagining, um, Dominic, and you don't need and Tongi, you don't need to ask, but you can nod. I'm imagining this is going to be ongoing work that we are going to need to be continuing to be refining and improving this because. You know, we, we, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know how this is going to evolve over 30 years. The methodologies are going to evolve. The scenarios are going to evolve. And we're going to have to keep updating and, and, and fine tuning that. And I'm, I'm hoping, therefore, that we will be seeing more of you at future events to explain how that um, evolution is progressing. And maybe and hopefully we'll be able to continue to, to tap into your, your work and your experience um, as um, you know, individual institutions start to um, tackle tackle this. So really with, with that, and as it's now just gone five o'clock, it just remains to say um, thank you to, to, to you both. Um, thank you to the GFA team, uh, Jenny, and the, the, the um, often hidden but always active behind the scenes, Phoebe, who's helped to, ad to administer this. Um, and thank you, um, my, my co-chair, Danny, and thank you to everybody who has uh, joined in the session. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.